Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 20. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. This first registration took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family line of David, to be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Then she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him snugly in cloth and laid him in a feeding trough, because there was no room for them at the inn. In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields, keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today a Saviour who is Messiah the Lord was born for you in the city of David. This will be the sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped snugly in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly hosts with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people his favor, he favours. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They hurried off and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the feeding trough. After seeing them, they reported the message they were told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart and meditating on them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they'd seen and heard, just as they'd been told. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you open your newsletters there, there's an outline on the left-hand side. Uh, there'll be a version of this sermon, a video recording online later on today if you want to listen to it again, and there'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end, God willing. Well, let me begin with a question that I've already posed uh, a little bit with the kids. What are your hopes and fears? Uh, let me share with you some of mine that I've had, well, uh, just from a specific period. Uh, one of my hopes in my teenage years was that I would run at the Olympics. Uh, that was a dream that I had, one of my hopes, until Dad sat me down at the start of year 12 and said, Bernard, you're never going to make it, mate. Uh, you, you're trying, you're, you're very good, but you've actually come to a crossroad. You've got to make a decision. If you want to pursue that, Bernard, you're just going to have to be permanently selfish. You're going to have to be number one in everything. And let me tell you, you can do that, but let me tell you, son, you're still not going to make it. There went my hopes and all my fears suddenly emerged. What am I going to do with my life? Uh, I've kept running ever since, but my fears emerged a few years ago when I decided to try water skiing over the age of 40. Don't do it. And my right hamstring blew out. And the doctor said, you'll never run again. Hopes and fears. Now, they're really quite trivial, aren't they? Those hopes and fears that I've just shared. We've all got hopes, aspirations and dreams, desires that we would love to see fulfilled. We also all have fears, don't we? Anxieties, concerns and worries that we dread coming true. Our hopes and fears can be big things. They can be existential. They can be global. They can be matters of the heart, the nature of the human will. Well, they can be slightly smaller things. What will I get in 25 days? What will my run time be at park run? There's a workplace relationship. Individuals can have hopes and fears. So can nations, ethnic communities. Hopes and fears can be in the present and you can reach out and touch them or they can be eternal and perhaps waiting to be seen. Micah had hopes and fears. And God spoke very clearly to them. Let me pray and we're going to look at them together. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, it is delightful in such peace and security with fans and windows open, uh, rain that's come. Uh, it, it can be delightful to open your word. 
But Father, please don't let the delight make us apathetic or blind or hard-hearted. Father, speak to our hopes and fears today, just like you did to Micah, just like you did to Mary and Joseph, just like you did to Herod and the chief priests. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the next few weeks in the church calendar are called Advent. Uh, It's a very easy Latin word. It means waiting. Uh, In these weeks leading up to Christmas on the church calendar, we think about waiting, just like God's people did for over 700 years as we prepare for Christmas when the waiting is answered. Over these next few weeks, we're going to look at four Christmas carols. Uh, It's a bit of a strange thing to do, but I want us to do it for three simple reasons. The first is that this is one of the few times in our wider society we do community singing. It's one of the few times in our culture, our collective memory, when all of the community has some notion of carols and singing. And so it's right throughout every part of our community, wherever you go, even if it's just the background music in the shop. Second, as we do this, I want us to develop a habit to develop the habit of passing all we sing through the Word of God. Uh, Just thinking about what we sing, why we sing it, and how it expresses the truth of God's Word. And thirdly, I want us to familiarise ourselves again with stuff that we are overly familiar with. Uh, When I said Luke 2, 1 to 20, most of us would go, I think that's probably about the angel shepherds or maybe the wise men. We, We know this stuff, don't we? But it's worthwhile familiarising ourselves with this stuff through the words of poets and the words set to music. Let's spend some time with Micah. Micah is in Jerusalem. I have point two on the outline. Uh, We're 700 years before the birth of Jesus. For decades now, God's people have been divided into two. There's a northern kingdom and the capital is Samaria. There's a southern kingdom and the capital is Jerusalem. Uh, In the north, God's mob bowed down to a golden calf. Uh, The king was very thoughtful. He didn't want them to travel to Jerusalem, so he made them an idol. So they just didn't have to log the kilometres. In the south, they used the temple in Jerusalem, but the behaviour in both kingdoms towards God is the same. In both places, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, and God is treated like a lucky charm you rub when things are grim. And God sends prophet after prophet to speak to his people, north and south. Prophets are very simple people. They speak the word of God to God's people. That's what a prophet does. And a prophet calls God's people back to him and says, remember who your God is. Practice. Practice God. Proclaim God. Each time God sends a prophet God also says, listen to them. If you don't listen, I'm going to hold you to account. Did you hear that in Psalm 89? I'm going to hold you to account. I will bring judgment on you. And so God does. The northern kingdom has just been wiped out by the Assyrian Empire, carted off into exile. That kingdom will never exist ever again, ever again. And now this Assyrian Empire has come down to Jerusalem and Jerusalem is under siege. The king Hezekiah and all of his people are trapped there in Jerusalem. Isaiah describes it as the water has risen to their chins. And if you know what that's like. And they are trapped in that city. Just imagine the smells. Just imagine the desperation. Just imagine the fear. We've never really felt it, have we? No food in. No rubbish out. You're cowering in a city. Everywhere you look as you stand on the city walls, you can just see tent after tent. The smoke rises up and the smells and the horses and the chariots and the clinking as they sharpen their swords. And Micah is there with them. And he has been given a job of being a prophet. Of all the jobs you want, that's probably not the job you want at this time because you're speaking for the bloke who's brought the Assyrians to the city gate. God's just done what he promised 
And Micah keeps calling God's people back, warning them that the day is here, pointing, just look over the border 20 kilometres to the north and watch the smoke from the ruins of what Samaria was like. He's carrying there. Do you think he had hopes and fears? He had hopes. Father, take me before they come through the gates. He had hopes. Father, take the Assyrians away. In fact, he had fears. Is God gone? Is God dead? What will happen to the people of God and all those marvellous promises? Will we ever exist again as you look over the border to Samaria? Turn to page 826 in your Bibles because God speaks to Micah, through Micah, to his own people. Micah chapter 5, verse 1. God recognises the situation. He recognises now, daughter who is under attack, you slash yourself in grief. The siege is set against us. They are striking the judge of Israel on the cheek with a rod. And they slash themselves because they're now turned to any God they can find. And that's what the prophets and priests of Baal did. Because you could get the attention of Baal if you had enough blood. Because God's not listening, but God is listening. God has said, I know exactly what you are experiencing. I know this reality because I've brought it on you because you ignored me. And then God speaks to them. Look there in Micah 5 verse 2, Bethlehem Ephrathah, you are small among the clans of Judah. One will come from you to be ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity, from eternity. God says to Micah, go up to the city wall. Look out over that Assyrian encampment to the south. And just six miles down the road, there is a little, little town called Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a town of little consequence. It's a blink and you'll miss it kind of town. From there, God will save his people. Did you hear that? From that town, God will save his people. In fact, that town is the smallest among the clans of which tribe? Judah. Do you remember what Jacob said to Judah last week in Genesis 49? How Judah will give birth to a king that will rule the world? God's saying exactly the same thing. One day there'll be a king from that little town, from that tribe of Judah. This isn't God being reactionary. God's always proactive. Do you notice that there at the end of verse 2? How long has he planned for Bethlehem's significance? From eternity. It's not as if God's woken up one day and gone, gee, that mic is persistent. I better do something. God's just revealing what he's always intended. And Micah needs to be reminded that all of these threads of the promises of God will come together one day. God even gives them a timing. Did you see that there in verse 3? Do you see how open and honest God is? In fact, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to abandon you just like you've abandoned me. God's fair in his time. If you want to abandon me, then it's okay. You can have life that way. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? But then he gives them another time. There'll be a moment when that abandonment will end and a woman will give birth to a child. And Micah goes, bang, I remember that from Genesis 3.15, where God says that a seed from a woman will crush a snake. You see, that's the big picture here as God's speaking. That's why the start of verse 5 is so important. Not there will be peace. He will be peace. Because in that timing, God gives them a vision for the future. Then the rest of his brothers, verse 3, will return to the people of Israel. You'll no longer be divided. He'll stand and shepherd them in the strength of Yahweh, in the majestic name of Yahweh, his God. They'll live securely. For then his greatness will extend to the ends of the earth. He will be their peace. And at mention of shepherds, you remember who else came from Bethlehem? Who else came from Bethlehem? Well, there was a bloke who was a shepherd. Remember him? His name's David, who, who looked after God's people and made sure they were secure. But in fact, God's dealing with deeper things than just the Assyrians and David, isn't he? God's dealing with the cause. God's not saying, I'll get them to put down their spears or guns. God's saying, I will bring peace in him. 
You see, God's saying, I'm going to deal with sin. The Assyrians are expressing it. You're experiencing it. You have committed it. I will deal with it. In a baby born in Bethlehem. Where where is God? God's listening. God's speaking. What's God doing? What he's always planned? Getting Bethlehem ready. It'll take time. Will God's mob get out of this? Do they have a future? They certainly do, and it'll be glorious. It'll be a future of unity. It'll be a future of security. It'll be a future where the cause of all of our fears and the thief of our hopes, sin, will be dealt with, all in that little town down the road. We'll move forward some years. I'm at point three on the outline. Move forward some years, more than 700 years. If you've got your Bibles there, turn to page 809. God's people remain cowering. There remains a wolf at the gate. In fact, now the wolf is in the city. Rome rules the universe. God has abandoned his people in silence for 400 years. The hopes and fears remain the same as Micah. Where's God? What about the promises of God? What will happen to God's people? They all sound familiar, don't they? I suspect that in the last six months, you, us, we might have asked some of those questions, mightn't we? Caesar Augustus wants more money. He needs to count his population so he can tax them. The wolves make everyone move. Go back to your birthplace. So I can count you. Nothing's changed since the Assyrians are at the gates of Jerusalem. God's people are shoved and pushed and pulled around. And as Luke writes the account of what is taking place in the realm of politics, as Joseph returns to his birthplace, what's the name of that birthplace? Bethlehem. And alongside that place name, a familiar shepherd's name is mentioned. What's his name? David. All your alarm bells should be ringing. All your spidey senses are going off, aren't they? And we remember Micah. And remember the promise of God as he cowered in Jerusalem, speaking to his hopes and fears. And as Joseph returns to Bethlehem, the city of the greatest shepherd, well, actually the village of the greatest shepherd of God's people, David, who does he take with him? A woman called Mary. And Mary is... Pregnant, and when they returned to Bethlehem, the time came for her to give birth to a daughter. No, not a daughter, a son. And she laid him in a feeding trough. Everything Micah had heard from God is taking place. Everything. Everything. We've just got to get a positive idea at this point, don't we? Because there are a lot of babies that have been born in Bethlehem. And it comes from another group of people, doesn't it? Another group of people who are as inconsequential as Bethlehem. A group of people called shepherds. It's worth noting how God uses the inconsequential. How God uses the small and the despised and the marginalised to bring his plans about. They're minding their sheep. They're out in the paddocks. The sheep are penned up in an enclosure and they're guarding the gates and then they're rudely disturbed, aren't they? Look there in verse 10 of Luke 2. The angel said to them, don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people today. A saviour who is Messiah the Lord was born for you in the city of David. This will be the sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped snugly in cloth and lying in a manger. Here is our positive identification Go and find this baby who ticks all the boxes. It will be like this and he will be, do you notice that word peace there in verse 14? He will be your peace just as God said back in Micah chapter 5 verse 5. He will end hostility by dealing with our sin. And there it is in Bethlehem just as God promised Micah, just As the angel said, the shepherds go, they find the boy, and then what do the shepherds do? They wait the whole town and say, remember Micah? Remember Micah? Others know the truth of Micah's words. 
Turn with me to page 855 in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. Others know the truth of Micah's words and yet they sit and this event passes them by because they are willfully ignorant. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Matthew writes, Matthew 2 verse 1, don't miss, he's referring to Micah. Micah's the only prophet in the Old Testament who puts a marker, a pin on Bethlehem. No one else mentions it. Micah does. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, wise men from the east arrived unexpectedly in Jerusalem. It disturbs everyone. We'll learn a bit more about them in three weeks' time. Herod the king is completely thrown, his capital city with him. Foreigners have come looking for the king of the Jews. So Herod turns to all those people who've been to Bible college and he asks them a very, very clear question in Matthew 2 verse 4. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them where the Messiah would be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, because out of you will come a leader who will shepherd my people Israel. What a moment. A very simple question. Where will the promised saviour be born? A very simple answer. Don't you know Micah? A very simple response would have been, why don't we toddle off like the shepherds are meeting? That would have been a good response. Travel 10 kilometres down the road. See, the saviour of the world, but a very common response is shown instead, isn't it? If you like to put it in our common language, these people have sung the Christmas carol so often that they don't care. They know the passages so well, they don't care. They've put up their nativities every year, they don't care. They know exactly where the saviour should be born and what do they do? They go and get another cup of coffee and they go on with their days. Or or you could be like Herod who works out the times very carefully and then just kills every child that matches the description. Some people can be like that towards these promises, aggressive, antagonistic, violent. It's either apathy or aggression. They still have the same hopes and fears, don't they? But they know what God has promised and they're apathetic or aggressive. The answer's right there. It's only 10 k's down the road. And instead they go and get another latte or they shake their fist at God because notice God's people here reject what he has said to them. In 1865 on Christmas Eve, I'm at the last point on the outline, Phillips Brooks was on a holiday and he rode a horse through Bethlehem at night. Philip Brooks was a single man, an ordained Anglican minister from America on holidays. As he rode through Bethlehem, close to midnight on Christmas Eve, he was struck by how silent it was, how peaceful, how quiet. Brooks was an accomplished musician and songwriter and he wanted to capture that moment so that others would know that this town of no consequence had answered the hopes and fears of all the years. In fact, he was very explicit in saying that he wrote a song for children that could be sung by children so that every generation would know that our hopes and fears are met. We're about to sing that song and it's the last line of the first stanza that stands out. It captures the biblical truth we've seen from Micah to shepherds to religious leaders. In Bethlehem on that night, God answers the hopes and fears of all these. God speaks to his character. He is intensely invested in the lives of his people in this broken world. God knows our hopes and fears and he speaks to it. He promises to it. God speaks to his own trustworthiness. He does exactly as he has promised from Genesis 3.15 right through to the present day. God speaks to his own significance. Does God choose the mighty 
Does God choose the glorious? Does God choose the well-dressed? Does God choose the opulent? God uses the insignificant, the despised, the tiny, the ignored and the small so his grace is seen. And then God speaks to our salvation. Here is the answer to your hopes and fears. He'll shepherd you. He'll heal you. He will take away your sin and restore you. And then do you notice that God speaks to our responses? Will you be a shepherd? Or will you be a religious leader with Herod? God answers our hopes and fears from all the years in that one night in Bethlehem. Will we come and see and rejoice and spread the news? Or are we so familiar we're already thinking of our next cup of coffee, trusting in our own wisdom, our own power, our own authority to answer our own hopes and fears. And how do we go with that? Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thanks for Micah. Thanks that you show that you are invested in this world, not reactionary but proactive. Thank you that you make promises that you keep. Thank you that you do so to point to your nature of grace and thank you that you confront us. Father, thank you that in Jesus the hopes and fears of all the years are met in him. Help us to know that. Amen.